While radio is closely identified with the 1920s, by the end of the decade, it was still in its infancy. However, it had begun to develop at a rapid pace and would eventually change society forever. But what was radio like in the 1920s? Let's find out. The development of radio and the concept of wireless communication began in the late 19th century. The origins of the first patents related to radio are still disputed to this day. While Guglielmo Marconi is popularly credited with inventing the radio, it is also believed that famed reclusive inventor Nikola Tesla was the first to successfully send a wireless radio signal. However, Tesla, if he had in fact been the first to do this, he was certainly not the first to have it patented. That milestone went to Marconi. And it was also Marconi who sent the first wireless transmission across the Atlantic Ocean on December 12, 1901. But development in radio was slow. During World War I, it was used almost exclusively as a means of communication with ships out at sea. By the outset of the 1920s, it had more or less stayed there. The first commercial radio broadcast came from the KDKA station in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which on November 2, 1920, informed the around 1,000 people who were tuned in that Warren G. Harding had won the presidential election. It should also be noted that radio signals were more powerful and far-reaching than most people realize. As we learned earlier, Marconi sent a transmission across the Atlantic Ocean in 1901, but few non-military or government-run stations were allowed to transmit across huge distances, and they had to be issued a license which limited them to a smaller range. In the first half of the 1920s, radio was mostly a hobby for many enthusiasts. A small group of enthusiasts began learning how to build their own radio sets and tinker with them and pick up another person's signal if they were lucky but there really wasn't that much to listen to other than some experimental stations set up in big cities. Most radio signals had a short broadcasting range, and what they sent was usually not very interesting. But even so, it must have seemed almost magical that you could receive a communication like that. By the middle of the decade, some local businesses made broadcasts that may have included a skit or performance of some kind, but the main purpose was simply to advertise to anyone who might be listening. The most well-known use of radio was commercial. The 1920s saw the creation of the two most important radio networks, the National Broadcasting Company in 1926 and the Columbia Broadcasting System in 1927, NBC and CBS respectively. After a handful of important broadcasts, including a nearly hour-long live broadcast of Charles Lindbergh returning to Washington in June 1927, there was an increased interest in radio as a means of reporting news and sporting events, but more importantly, as a means of selling products. Radio ownership was increasing, and with it, the number of programs. With the advent of big commercial radio stations, enough money was gathered, mostly from advertisers, to put on bigger productions, though these would pale in comparison to later programs in the following decades. This system of sponsoring programs in exchange for advertising has proved to be very long-lasting, going into the television age and more recently into the YouTube age as well. What proved to be very successful for radio was music. This may seem natural to us today, but the 1920s was the first time that radio music broadcasting took shape. Although these were usually funded by advertisers, there was usually just a quick mention of the sponsor's name, and the show would resume. The first sponsored radio show was the Ever Ready Hour, an hour-long program that first began all the way back in December 1923, years before the establishment of big commercial radio networks. For many people, this setup seemed remarkable. After the initial cost of the radio set and some later minor maintenance, they could listen to music almost continuously throughout the day for free. Unlike films or stage shows, you didn't have to pay for admission. It may have even seemed impossible that such a system could sustain itself. And the system was struggling, more than most people knew. Radio couldn't do the same show over and over like films and stage shows. There was a huge demand for different programming for every broadcast, and the finances were hard to keep up with, even for the big networks. But nonetheless, commercial radio continued on. Though there were plenty of commentators who did not see a bright future for commercial radio, and thought it would just be a novelty that would fade away. One wrote, Radio broadcasting is spectacular and amusing, but virtually useless. It is difficult to make out a convincing case for the value of listening to the material now served out by the American broadcasters. Even if the quality of this material be improved, as it undoubtedly will be, one must still question whether the home amusement thus so easily provided will sufficiently raise the level of public culture to be worth what it costs in time and money and the diversion of human effort. 
Others predicted that radio would just be another means of flinging more advertisements at listeners and perpetuating the shockingly materialistic society that America was becoming. Another commentator wrote, with great annoyance, And now we know what we have gotten radio. Just another disintegrating toy. Just another medium like the newspapers, the magazines, the billboards, and the mailbox for advertisers to use in pestering us. A blatant signboard erected in the living room to bring us news of miraculous oil burners, fuel-saving motor cars, cigar lighters that will always light. While the vast majority of radio programs in the 20s were musical in nature, there were exceptions. The most extraordinary of these was Amos and Andy. Amos and Andy was a comedy program about two black men living in Harlem, voiced by two white men in African-American vernacular, and it proved to be a massive success. The duo, consisting of Freeman Gosden and Charles Carell, had its roots in an earlier show called Sam and Henry, which began in January 1926 on the Chicago network WGN, owned by the Chicago Tribune newspaper. It was only a regional success since it was only broadcast within a limited range. But Gosden and Carell wanted to capitalize on their success and make phonograph records of their radio programs so that they could be distributed to other radio stations around the country, but WGN refused to do this. So instead, Gosden and Carell went elsewhere, landing jobs at WMAQ, a station owned by the Chicago Daily News. They could not use the same two characters, so they created two almost identical copies named Amos and Andy. The new station took them on and allowed them to record episodes for distribution and rebroadcast. This was the first use of syndication in radio. The new series was first broadcast in March 1928. The show essentially ran as a radio comic strip with the same characters and even continuing storylines, a development which was brand new at the time. And this was probably the first time the concept was used in a comedy show. The dialects of Gosden and Carell were so well done that many people thought they were black until they saw their photos in a newspaper or magazine. Many people today would consider the show offensive and racist. But of course, at the time, it wasn't thought of that way, at least not among whites. The dialects used did seem to be pretty authentic replications of the way a large group of black Americans actually talked at that time, but I'm not an expert. The characters themselves did sometimes display racial stereotypes. However, as the show developed, they did become more nuanced and suffered from the same universal problems that many people, white and black, had to deal with. One obvious stain to the show's image is that the theme song for both the radio and later television show was taken from the controversial and overtly racist film Birth of a Nation. By the end of the 20s, Gosden and Carell had become two of the first superstars of radio, but there were others as well. Take for example Rudy Valley. Valley was a young singer whose regular appearances on radio shows turned him into such a big sensation that he got his own show, and was particularly adored by young women who swooned over him. If you want to know more about how Rudy Valley became a national sensation, please check out my video about him. By the end of the 1920s, it was clear that radio was on its way up. It had gradually become more and more viable as an entertainment medium that could secure enough money from advertisers to make better programming. This is certainly not the end of the story of radio. It would go on to change the course of history, especially in the 1930s, a time when the Great Depression hit many very hard financially. Radio was a cheap source of entertainment that, by then, offered a dizzying array of different shows. And it became used as an important source for news, becoming, by far, the fastest way to send out breaking stories across the country. President Franklin D. Roosevelt also used it for his fireside chats to reassure impoverished Americans during the Great Depression. Then it was used extensively during World War II for war news and entertainment, as well as propaganda. And, like silent films, radio had just reached its zenith of creativity and quality when it was quickly and completely overtaken by television by the mid-1950s. But all of that is out of the confines of this channel. Radio in the 1920s developed quickly, though it had not completely matured by the end of the decade. But it had immense promise. Such a small little box could provide endless entertainment for no extra charge. Some were just captivated by the distance radio signals traveled to get to them. Simply listening to an advertisement over the radio was endlessly fascinating for some people. Radio was one of the most important inventions of the 20th century, and it all really got going in the 1920s. Before I end this video, I want to make a quick plug. I encourage anyone who is interested in vintage radio to check out Old Time Radio, or OTR. There you can find real pieces of radio history preserved for your entertainment. 
While there are few surviving broadcasts from the 1920s, you can find thousands of shows from the early 1930s to the 1950s. I hope you enjoyed this video and learned something about the greatness that was early radio. If you want me to cover a certain topic about the 1920s, please let me know in the comments below. Well, that's all for now while you sheiks and gals out there, but stay tuned for more tales from the jazz age.